Welcome to this webinar on critical thinking for your research project. So you want to know more about critical thinking. This video is great for those who are doing a dissertation or investigation research project, want to learn how to critically evaluate arguments, are writing an argumentative essay, want to understand how to assess the credibility of supporting evidence, and would like to know how to recognise common flaws in arguments. What we'll cover. First, we're going to look at what critical thinking really is. We're then going to talk about why we should care about critical thinking skills as a society. We'll learn how to make arguments out of claims and talk about using credible evidence. We'll look at how to recognise common flaws and how to evaluate arguments. By the end of this video, you'll know more about how to improve your critical thinking skills as it pertains to your dissertation or investigation. Let's first look at what is commonly understood by critical thinking. Critical thinking is the analytical thinking that underlies all rational discourse. In other words, using reason or logic in thinking about a problem. Critical thinking is about evaluating and analysing existing research on your topic and evaluating arguments and information. Distinguishing between facts and opinions. Taking an honest approach when facing personal biases. Asking pertinent questions and always seeking new and improved solutions to existing problems. This is what a critical thinker does. Presenting information and arguments coherently and evaluating your own thought processes. So why do we care about critical thinking skills as a society? Why is critical thinking so important for doing a research project, such as the extended project qualification? Critical thinking enables us to make informed choices. It helps us find the most pertinent information and rationally evaluate our options. It improves our argumentation skills and fosters curiosity and self-reflection. It can help us solve problems because it teaches us to truly understand the basis of the problem and our options. It improves our decision-making processes. It gives us the ability to evaluate and improve current standings and thereby brings about innovation. And as most importantly, it teaches us as a society to be more open-minded and assess and overcome our personal biases. Critical thinking is therefore a hallmark of an educated and well-functioning society. Now that we know what we stand to gain from training ourselves in critical thinking, let us look at how we can apply it to writing arguments. You have already learned about the structure of arguments in more detail in our video, Structuring and Creating Arguments and Counterarguments. So let's just recap on what an argument is made up of. Arguments are central to critical thinking. First, let's define what we mean by argument in this context. An argument is really just an attempt to convince your reader of your point of view. It consists of a conclusion and at least one reason that supports this conclusion. Your reason is what provides a logical basis for your conclusion. And your conclusion is based on reasons and aims to persuade your reader of your point of view. Your evidence is where you provide support for your reason. An argument needs to consist of all three parts in order to be convincing. Let's look at the following example. You won't need an umbrella because it will be sunny today. The weather forecast said that there was a 0% chance of rain. As you can see, the order in which you put the individual components of your argument doesn't matter. Here we start with the conclusion, you won't need an umbrella, and then go on to explain why. If you don't provide the reason and the evidence for your conclusion, then you don't have a whole argument. You will simply have a claim. A claim is a statement that can be challenged because it lacks reason. If you simply state that young people should be allowed to vote at 16, you are not presenting an argument, but an opinion. In order to make an argument out of it, you need to add supporting reasons and evidence. This is a key skill in critical thinking. For example, you could add the following. At this age, they already enjoy other privileges and responsibilities of adulthood, such as being able to leave home, join the armed forces, get married or pay taxes. 
Here, you provide both a reason and some pertinent examples that strengthen your point. It is important to foster political involvement and awareness early on in order to ensure that elections are taken seriously by all citizens. By adding this other reason, you have further explained your stance on the issue, so you can now round it up by stating your initial claim that can now function as a conclusion. It is therefore crucial that young people should be eligible to vote as early as 16 years of age. And now, what was a simple claim has become an argument. Now that we have revised how to make an argument, let's recap on how to address counterarguments. As has been covered in previous videos, a counterargument is just an argument that seeks to invalidate your conclusion. If you find logical or factual flaws in a strong argument used by the opposing side, you can strengthen your own argument by highlighting these flaws. Addressing counterarguments shows that you have taken both sides into consideration and makes your arguments more convincing. Let's have a look at the following example paragraph on the topic of whether it is necessary to regulate the introduction of genetically modified crops. First, in red, the author states the counter argument that GM crops are unsafe for human consumption and may take over the countryside. The author then goes on to oppose these claims by pointing out the factual flaws in the opponent's logic. These are in black. For example, the author says that they do not take into account that genetic modification of plants and animals has been taking place for centuries and can be seen in practices such as selective breeding. The author also goes on to state that GM crops are really not that different from golden delicious apples or even eggs from a hen and therefore should not be subject to special regulations. Now that we have covered the more basic aspects of constructing arguments, let's have a look at some of the finer points. When reading any argumentative piece of writing, you should always look out for assumptions. An assumption is a missing reason that is accepted by the reader without being stated. It is therefore basically a gap in the author's reasoning. To demonstrate what we mean by that, let's have a look at the following example. The office safe has been broken into. Harry has not come into work this morning, therefore Harry must have taken the money. In this text there are therefore two clear assumptions. First, the author assumes that there was money in the safe before it was broken into. And second, it is assumed that Harry has no other reason for being late. This is a rather obvious example of an assumption and also one where a gap in the reasoning is quite large. If either of the assumptions turns out to be wrong, the whole argument falls apart. That doesn't mean that you should never use assumptions, but rather goes to illustrate that you have to be careful in just how much of a leap you can ask your reader to take. In some cases, you may have to use assumptions in your writing and you may not have the space to state every reason or you may not find conclusive evidence to support one of your reasons. Using assumptions in your writing only works if the reason you leave out is not central to your argument. Assumptions must seem natural to a reader by being logical and difficult to contest. Being aware of assumptions can also help you contend counter arguments if you can point out that an assumption in your opponent's reasoning is not logical to make. Having talked about conclusions and reasons, let's now move on to talk about evidence. Evidence is central to constructing an argument and should be used critically and with thought. Evidence should be used to support the claim or key point that you make. You need to think critically about the sorts of evidence you are using. As we have covered in previous videos, there are many forms of evidence. Using examples to illustrate your point, examples that embody what you're talking about. In some cases, statistical or numerical data, which can be very convincing if it's presented well. You can even use estimates, as long as you can guarantee that they have a firm basis and a representative. Depending on your topic, you may use a statement or a quote from a source or a witness as part of your evidence. Factual claims, which are statements based on facts that can be verified and are often also used to support your point. No matter what form your evidence takes, make sure that it's convincing and easy to interpret. You don't want your reader to be overwhelmed by facts, but guide them through how the evidence you use helps your case. It is often best to have fewer 
better developed pieces of evidence than lots of facts that are not properly backed up and explained. There are no clear cut rules as to how to choose your evidence, but there are a few considerations you should always take into account as you're gathering your sources. You should critically assess the evidence you choose to support your arguments. You can do this by making sure that your evidence is relevant, it needs to be specific to your point. This may seem trivial, but it may just be the most important consideration when it comes to evaluating evidence. The clearer your message, the more convincing it is going to be. Evidence also has to be reliable. That means it has to come from a reputable source. Next, it needs to be representative. It has to be applicable to the circumstances you're describing. For example, if you use data from survey or polls, this means that your sample size has to be large enough to truly represent the target group you're writing about. It also has to be easy to interpret. Make sure that it is clearly phrased to avoid misunderstandings and explain it well. Lastly, your evidence can never be ambiguous. When you choose a piece of evidence, ask yourself, is there any other way that it could be interpreted? If so, you are making it too easy for your opponents to counter your argument, so make sure everything you use is clear and straightforward. Use these considerations as you choose your own evidence, but also when you evaluate counter arguments, as it may help you point out weaknesses in them. Part of thinking critically is also about evaluating the credibility of your sources, as mentioned previously. Assessing credibility is a key skill in critical thinking. An extended project qualification writer would be expected to evaluate the credibility of their sources, usually in the literature review, but also in their discussion section, if the source is being used there for the first time. Use reputable sources that provide an expertise in the field that you're writing about. You should check on the credentials of the location of the publication, as well as the author. For more details on this, you can see another video in the series titled Literature Reviews and Trustworthy Sources. As you evaluate evidence, think about whether your source has any motives to present the data in a certain way. For example, was it funded or conducted by a company or organisation with a stake in the matter? Pointing out conflicts of interest can be a very strong strategy to discrediting counter arguments as well. It is always best to use precise numbers or percentages where possible when using statistics. Be careful when you come across terms like a majority of or other terms which are ambiguous and non-specific. Take the phrase a majority of. Here, the difference between a majority and a minority may be just a few people. Therefore, it may not support a claim that you make very strongly. If you're using older sources, think about whether results could be different now as opposed to when the study was conducted. Older sources are not necessarily less credible, but think about how the date of writing might have implications for the content of the source. Consider sample sizes for polls and surveys. The larger the sample size, in other words, the larger the number of people included, the more likely it will be applicable to a larger section of the population or society or scientifically representative. Now that we have covered how to construct your own arguments, let us look at where this process can go wrong. A key element of critical thinking is recognising flaws in the arguments of others, as well as recognising your own flaws when constructing arguments. There are a few logical flaws that you should be aware of to help prevent you from making such faux pas in your own writing. Let's start with something called irrelevant conclusions. This is where your reasons and your conclusion are not related and therefore do not form an argument. Take a look at this example. Snakes are evil animals because they look mean. In the example given, the character of snakes seems to be derived from their appearance alone. Not only is that not a reasonable argument to make, but it's also entirely subjective. What looks mean to one person may look intelligent to another. This is therefore called an irrelevant conclusion. Next, inexperienced writers can sometimes fall into the habit of restating their conclusion instead of giving supporting reasons. This is called circular reasoning. Take a look at this example. The iPhone is the best smartphone you can buy because there are no better smartphones out there. As you can see in this example, the author merely chooses two different ways of saying the same thing, namely that the iPhone is the best smartphone. If it is the best, then there can be no better ones. 
The second part of the sentence is not adding any information and therefore decreases the quality of the argument. You may also come across arguments that misrepresent your opinions. This is known as a false dilemma. Take a look at the next example. You either like kids or you don't. In fact, liking kids or not liking kids are not your only options as is suggested by the example. You could like certain kids or certain character traits in kids. This is a very obvious example, but you may read a lot of arguments and should avoid constructing arguments that use extreme ends of a spectrum or radicalise a situation. Oversimplifying matters in this way is often a sign that the author doesn't have strong arguments for their specific point and plays on an emotional response instead. This is known as a false dilemma. Flaws in reasoning often come about due to a lack of good arguments. Another type of flaw is called attacking the opponent. It may seem like a good idea to discredit the opinion of your opponent, but staging personal attacks won't help your arguments. Take a look at this example. You didn't even have a good job. What would you know about work ethic? In this example given, the opponent appears discredited because the type of job they had. The attacker suggests that people with a certain type of job cannot have a strong work ethic. The attacker is also making subjective and personal judgments about the type of job. A type of job, however, is not necessarily directly linked to work ethic, so this argument is not based on sound logic. Often, and especially in a political context, people seek to give the impression of disproving counterarguments without actually addressing the content. Take a look at this example. My opponent believes that there is no reason to add to our military defence budget, but I despise the notion of leaving our country defenceless. In the example given, the attacker doesn't actually specify why they should add to their military defence budget, but instead plays on emotions as they suggest that not adding to it would leave the country defenceless. As you read and write, pay attention to such personal attacks. Remember that attacking your opponents will never make your arguments more convincing. You want to disprove the logical basis of their argument, not point out flaws in their character. Finally, let's see how jumping to conclusions can deteriorate your arguments. When you generalise, you make the assumption that because something is applicable to a few individuals, it will also be applicable to the group that they are a part of. Take a look at this example. Cats are good pets. Lions are cats. Therefore, lions are good pets. In the example given, you can see a more extreme version of such a generalisation. Many would agree that cats are good pets, and it is true that lions are also cats. Yet few of us would say that lions would make good pets. Just because it is true for part of the population, domestic house cats, doesn't mean that it will be true for all. You also have to be careful not to misinterpret causation when you write. Just because two things happened one after another doesn't mean that the first event caused the second. Here is an example. Eliza got soaked in the rain yesterday. Today she stayed at home because she's got the flu. Therefore, her flu was brought about by the rain. In the example, Eliza's getting soaked in the rain came before the flu, but you cannot conclude that the flu was necessarily caused by the rain. Flu is a viral infection and cannot be caused by exposure to rain. You cannot assume a link between the two pieces of information just because they're the only information you were given and because they happened one after another. Such common flaws in reasoning may seem very obvious in the examples presented here, but you will find countless variations of them as you read sources. Our goal is to make you aware of them so that they are easier to spot and avoid when you write your own arguments. The last topic we will cover is appeals. An appeal is an attempt to sway the reader by emotional persuasion. You may have noticed that some of the reasoning flaws we have just covered were playing on an emotion as well. However, in an appeal, the intention of manipulating a person's emotions is usually a lot more transparent. Appeals are sometimes, mistakenly, used as supporting reasons or evidence. While they're not all bad, appeals have to be taken with a pinch of salt. Too often they are used to manipulate rather than convince and manipulation has no place in academic writing. Appeals can be made to authority. By stating that perceived experts in the field would agree with a statement, the author suggests that the statement is true. For example, this is the best toothpaste on the market. 
two out of three dentists recommend it. However, simply stating that someone else thinks so too is not the same as giving evidence for your point. So be careful in how you use expert sources. You can also appeal to popularity. This is similar to an appeal to authority and that it relies on validation or affirmation from others. However, this time it's not experts, but the general public that serves as a witness. Here is an example. Cutting down on carbs is the best way to lose weight. Everyone is doing it. Again, just because everyone is supposedly doing something or thinking something does not make it a fact. As we've mentioned before, many appeals are centred around emotion. For example, you may have seen TV adverts from charities that show the aftermath of a natural disaster before asking viewers to donate money. This is playing on emotion. Remember that in academic writing, you want to convince by logic, supported by evidence and facts, not emotion. Appeals can also be made to tradition or history. Here, you rely on the fact that something has been done in a certain way for a long time and that that means it's the only right way to do it. For example, you cannot quit playing the piano. No one in this family has ever quit their musical education. As with other types of appeals, this is not based on logic and can easily be disproved. So be careful in using appeals in your writing. Now we'll take a look at some examples of a student's piece of work that critically evaluates sources and evidence as part of their writing. Take a look at the example at the top, the source of evidence. This is a fictional source from McCarthy 2019 about military presence in the Middle East. Have a look. Now take a look at the example student written analysis below, which might appear in the discussion section of the student's research project. The first paragraph in black gives evidence to support the point about the US military playing a central role in political life in the Middle East in response to the stated research question. In the paragraph below, the student references the top source. This is the writing in green. Then below in red, the student goes on to critically evaluate the source and call it into question. The student questions the source by saying that it does not give evidence to back up its claim of decreasing numbers of soldiers. The student also points out that the source makes an assumption about the number of troops decreasing in the next five to 10 years. The student references the fact that an automatic causal link is made between fewer troops at present, meaning a smaller number of troops in future too. Here is a data source, a graph which shows the projected percentage of UK population over 65 years old and estimated cases of dementia. This is from the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology. Below, you can see an example of some student text to analyse and use this source in black. Have a read. At the beginning of the paragraph, you note that the student outlines and interprets the data in the source in support of the claim that some authors state that the UK health system for dealing with dementia is going to become increasingly burdened. Below this, the student questions the efficacy of the source, in other words, how useful it is, given that it was published in 2007 and the student is now writing in 2020. Medical research and sociological changes have taken place since 2007. The student starts to explain that there are a number of factors since 2007 that might have had an impact on projected figures for total cases of dementia. If we were to continue looking at this power graph, we might see the student outline some of these factors and use more recent sources, such as Brown 2018, as evidence in support of their statement. So now that we have looked at some ways that critical thinking can improve your writing, let's recap the main terms and how they apply to your research project. We have talked about how to construct your argument and make it convincing. As you write your argument, you have to assess it critically. Is it clear? Is it difficult to counter? Does it have any inherent problems or flaws? As we have covered, every argument has to be supported by one or more reason. Your reasons have to be strong and unique. You cannot just restate your main point. The better you explain your reasons, the more convincing they will be. Your conclusion should always be based on your reasons and be very clearly phrased. Evidence is what can make or break an argument. We have looked at how to choose evidence and evaluate its credibility. Use the criteria we discussed to assess both your own and your opponent's evidence. 
we have arised how to address counter arguments and talked about how to make an argument out of a claim. You are now able to identify assumptions in writing and to know to look out for them in counter arguments. You also now understand what the purpose of appeals is and how to spot them. And very importantly, you can now identify and avoid common flaws in reasoning. As a critical thinker, you should always be on the lookout for ways to improve your writing and make your arguments even stronger. Now that you are aware of how critical thinking can improve your writing, here is a final checklist for you. When you write, ask yourself the following questions. You can use this as a checklist when assessing your own work at the end too. Are your conclusions supported by strong and relevant reasons? And if the reasons are relevant, do they make a difference to the conclusion? Can you back up all claims you make? Is your evidence credible and strong enough? Are there any potential problems with it? Does your evidence support your conclusion? Could any other conclusion be drawn from it? Is there any other evidence that could make a difference to the conclusion? Would more or other evidence make your case stronger? Are all explanations easy to understand or could they benefit from further clarification? Are there any obvious mistakes in your reasoning? It is often difficult to recognise a flaw as you are writing, so take time to look at the end over your arguments and ask yourself whether you have always had logic on your side. So what can you do next? Use our criteria for evaluating evidence as you choose which proof would best support your arguments. Practice identifying assumptions. This will help you avoid large leaps in your own writing, but also allow you to question information you read. Use our checklist for applying critical thinking in your writing, such as your dissertation or essay, and throughout your research project. With that, you have now familiarised yourself with the basic concepts of critical thinking and can apply it to improve your approach to writing for your research project. Thanks for listening.